Good morning. My name is Zen Riafan. I am currently working as technical advisor with IHS on the engineering portfolio for Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Today we will be having a webinar on pipeline modeling and a review of the best practices for trusting our forecasting results. One of my colleagues, Sylvia Ray Gomez, who is the subject matter expert for engineering portfolio, will be giving this presentation. If you have any questions during this presentation, please write them on the question box and she will address it at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Sylvia. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Henry mentioned, I'm going to be delivering a presentation on reliable pipeline modeling. This isn't exactly a new topic, and the reason why I'm bringing it up again is because often you tend to hear a lot of people saying that they don't tend to do reliable pipeline modeling, and this is on the basis that forecasted production usually does not match their actual production. And this actually leads me to talk about some of the important aspects of constructing a reliable pipeline model and a couple of the considerations that will allow us to minimize the error that we have associated when generating our production forecasting. Um, <clears throat> to generate a reliable forecast, there are five main components that we need to focus on. The, sur the surface calibration, where you need to consider how the 16 additional system losses change as your system pressures and your rates change. You need to take into consideration your compressor calibration, where you need to ensure that the capacity curves are actually representative of that capacity machine that you have. You need to take in consideration your deliverability or your inflow selection, which will actually represent the change in your inflow capability over time. And also your wellbore model because this one will effectively model the current pressure loss, but also will predict when you might have liquid loading or when this liquid loading could actually be an issue. And lastly, we actually bring all these components together, but uh, what we're going to try to do is to validate the conditions that we have right now and also make sure that they match in the future. So the following presentation is actually going to focus on these main components. We also need to keep in mind that it is going to be a short presentation, and I'm going to try to hit all these main points that you actually want to review so that you can actually come up with a reliable production forecast. <clears throat> so when we're developing a pipeline model, there are really two objectives that we need to focus on. The first of all, we need to create something that actually reflects true operating conditions. And this is really easy because, as you know, you can actually do any tweaks or changes to any operating parameters and then just get a match. But then we come to the challenging part, because the challenging aspect is making sure that all those changes are still going to reflect your changing operating conditions. In order to construct that model, so it's actually going to reflect that changing conditions, you need to make sure that you understand what's going to happen in the gathering system today. Some of the past accessible ways of modeling didn't really allow users to produce some of the best results. And this was because with making simple adjustments, as I, as I just mentioned, uh, to the measured pressure in the model, didn't actually match up with the future results. And unfortunately, some modelers, what they tend to adjust was uh, just the correlations by either using the pipe roughness, the correlation adjustments, or the flow efficiency. <clears throat> and what all these parameters actually do is they just adjust the frictional pressure loss component. And in a couple of situations where you actually have restrictions or something like that, you will see that it actually works sufficiently because if you do any kind of a small changes in rate, you see the appropriate adjustment in your pressure loss component. However, there are a couple of situations in which we have uh, liquids loading that are gathering in low spots, and this is due to low gas velocities. So what we're actually going to see is that this is not going to reflect the changing conditions adequately because with that hydrostatic pressure loss or those liquids sitting in those low spots, it's not going to adjust a whole lot you're not going to have the same additional pressure drop when you <clears throat> do any kind of increase in your flow rate. <coughs> if this is actually evident when you review these plots, because at low velocities, the friction loss is negligible. And then fudging a match by adjusting the correlation or the flow efficiency, we not account for future conditions appropriately. As you can see on these plots, 
With a small uh, increase in the rate, a large increase in pressure would occur. And this is not the case with liquids gathering in a low spot. If anything, the pressure loss will remain the same, or that loss is going to reduce because you're not going to be able to effectively reduce those liquids that are going through the line. So this is where the process hinges to be. What we're going to end up finding is that the process is not going to be suitable in all cases. So what is important to do is actually to go back, look at the root cause, and then see how all these adjustments actually are going to affect in the future. So where I should recommend always starting from? <clears throat> what you always need to do is understand the data that you're going to be using for calibration. It is very important that you start with the stabilized rates and pressure data. We want to minimize any type of transient pipeline effects within that data because, as you might note, all our correlations are based on a steady state conditions, meaning that the rate that you have coming in will actually match the rate that you have coming out of the system. So always, always try to have a look at your data and try to find the most stable operating period possible. The graph that we see here is actually showing the gas rate through the main delivery point over time. And so that allows us to very quickly pick a point in time that you actually see a stable. For example, the point here in the middle, in which we see four days of production time, we can see that the rate is very stable here. Then we have a closer look at the data and we have a feel on how reliable this production data on a well level is. So we're going to review the production data and ask different kinds of questions. And if this actually means that you need to go to the field and talk to the operators to determine some of the things, you definitely need to do so. We actually need to determine where the pressure measurements are made. If they're actually made at the wellhead or after the separation equipment on that individual facility. Because this is going to make a massive difference when you're looking at your data and your model and then comparing your measure versus your calculated pressure. This is actually going to be the, th uh, like the factor that is going to allow us to determine where any additional pressure losses may be in our field versus that model. Another thing is that we also want to get a feel for the re reliability of the data. <clears throat> you need to understand how the data is either being measured or recorded. You need to see if the data is actually being made electronically or is it recorded on a frequent basis. Or if it's in frequent production recording, if the operators are either going there once a week and they get the pressure recorded manually, or how the data is actually going to be got into our system. Because that is going to allow us to look closely and then understand how we can calibrate within our system. <clears throat> if we're actually looking at this plot, uh, or at the rate history for these individual wells, as it's showing in red in this plot, you can see that it's a purely stable rate history, but then, if we look at the, blue, at the blue line, we actually see a bit of fluctuation in our pressure data. And if this fluctuation is between 150 kPa or 20 psi, we know that we're not going to be able to calibrate our system any closer than that. So once we determine and look at the data, we can enter the data of our model. We can enter for comparison of the measure versus our calculated pressure. It's always important, once you enter your data into the model, that you limit your variables. So you can really determine where the difference is between the model and what is actually happening on the field. One of the most important things is to enter the data that you know. If you enter the well rates, you need to enter those as fixed well rates. You need to enter your delivery pump pressures or your suction pressures or your inlet facility pressures, all of them as fixed pressures. All this so you can then focus on what's happening on the pipeline segments. It starts with what you know. Once you generate the model, you need to make sure you verify what's coming into those facilities. You need to verify the suction pressures, your inlet rates, and then this will actually set the stage for using the data diagnostics. So it is very, very important that when you're comparing your measure and calculated pressures, and especially when we're in larger fields, to start looking at the overall trends. You need to start looking at the different data signatures, and I'm going to be showing you in the next slides because these are actually going to help you to hone in on what's happening in the field and understand what you might be missing in your model. The next few slides that I'm going to be showing here are maps that are generated with the IHS Piper software. In this case, the bubble map is showing the difference between pipeline measure pressures and calculated results. And the tolerance limit that we have set here, it's plus or minus 10 PSI, and it's showing in yellow. The gas flows to the compressor station, which is circle on the right, and we can see that everything to the west of that compressor station is upstream. So when we start looking upstream, we can see that everything is calibrated really nicely until I actually get to the northwest section. 
All of those wells in the northwest section are out about by a common amount. And that common amount, it's around, I don't know, a range between 10 to 20 PSI, higher than we actually were calculated. So what this data signature is showing me is that there is a point in my model where there is a pressure loss that I'm not taking in consideration for, and I actually need to get more information about. So what we tend to do, we tend to have a closer look, and then we understand and verify that true difference. We start looking at the annotations. In this case, I'm showing the difference between the measure and the calculated pressure. So if I start looking from the south to the north, I can actually see that the difference kind of ranges between 17 to 22 PSI difference. I can also view the locations where I don't know any information about. And, for example, in this case, I can see that the last yellow well, which is plus or minus 10 PSI, but also there is a portion of my line segment where I have no measurements, and then I have my next well, which is about an acceptable range by 17 PSI. So, next, I'm just going to focus on the area and gather more pressure information to actually pinpoint what's my source of the additional loss. So when we're reviewing all these data signatures and we see a step change, the step change means that there is localized difference in my model versus reality. And this difference is going to allow us to earn more questions. As I mentioned before, we need to get to the operators and if it's needed, take more measurements and then actually confirm that this is not related to any kind of losses at our surface facilities. If we actually isolated that additional loss within pattern segment, we actually need to figure out why. So, we have a look at the velocity within the pipeline, and then we see if it's a very low velocity. We have to understand that if we are going to have a very low velocity, that will likely be a hydrostatically dominated effect. And then we start looking for an elevation change in the system, and we start evaluating the potential of either liquid loading or liquid accumulate, accumulating in low, in, low, in low spots. If, for example, we're going to have a very high velocity, we're going to start looking at everything that could affect the frictional pressure loss component to that line. Um, I can't make this clear enough, but we always need to look at our data, because our data is always going to be our common weak point. It is possible that we have different pipeline diameter or pipeline length compared to what we originally entered from our database. So, the next step, if we actually have a review to our data and ensure that our data was not the weak point, that our data was right, we actually look at any kind of operational parameters. We have to check if it's due to either wax or if you're having any sort of scale buildup, or if you're having any kind of unknown restrictions such as a hot tap. Unfortunately, sometimes the hot tap borehole is smaller than the connecting lines, and this is actually going to be causing a restriction. So we need to have a look for any kind of potential item that is causing that frictional loss or frictional restriction. Um, in the case that we have determined that is not a data issue and that we know that cannot be changed in the model, we need to actually account for those additional losses accordingly. For example, if we're going to have a fictional type loss due to a hot tap, we know that we're not going to be able to remove that loss from our system. So what we need to make sure is that we consider it under any kind of changing conditions. In another example, if we're drilling um, any new wells or if we're anticipating any additional gas inflow, what we would expect is that that type of loss is going to increase, so we're going to add it as a variable loss. In a different case, if we have a liquid sitting in a low spot, we want to evaluate whether or not where it's going to be valid to keep that loss in our model and keep it as a fixed type loss. If we're actually going to be able to readily pick that line and remove those liquids by picking, are we sure we're going to be able to do this? If not, then what we tend to do is just leave it in our model, but we need to actually keep in mind and then bring in any additional gas that we want to remove that loss. So the first data signature is that a step change that is going to show us that the localized difference in our models versus reality and is going to take us to actually evaluate more questions. The second common signature that we're going to see is a systemic difference. Within the system, as we look from our compressor station out into our field, what we see is that there is a difference between the measure and the calculated pressure, and they are getting larger and larger. In this slide, we can see that this is a very good visual tool, and you can see this by the changes between the yellow and this getting into the hotter colors, as in the reds or the orange that you have. This systemic difference, or these signatures, can actually point out to what you could be missing in your model. So that's one of the items I mentioned at the beginning, is to check your inlet rate versus your model rate and make sure that they are representative of one another. Because if they are not, 
you could see that systemic difference within the model or the different bubble map colors that I showed before. If you have been able to rule that out, then you need to start looking at any kind of multi-phase flow effects and then making sure you're actually taking those in consideration. You need to also make sure that you're using the right multi-phase pressure loss correlation and then make sure that you incorporate any kind of elevation changes and you're using the appropriate sewer properties. As you can see, the diagnostics and the surface calibration can tell us way more about how our system is operating and how it's going to operate in the future. What needs to be considered is about truly understanding what's going to happen in the system and how your system is actually going to respond to any kind of changing conditions. We also need to understand that there can be any kind of model errors, and this could be either related to human errors, related to either data entries or that data was not taken in the time consideration that was originally thought. So we need, really need to rely on those signatures and ask more questions. Make sure that we understand why our model is actually going to be different. So we want to focus on ruling out any of those issues, and we actually, when we hone into any additional pressure loss and have been able to attribute it either to a hydrostatic or a frictional pipe restriction, then we will be able to model it appropriately and then make sure it's actually going to be representative of our changing conditions. So just to summarize, uh, the best practices for the pipeline calibration portion is first of all, that we make sure to start with the data set and understand the limitations of the data set. As I can't make it any clearer, make sure that your data set is not your weakest point. You also need to make sure that you know where those pressure measurements are made and how close we can actually calibrate our model. Then, we actually move into the diagnostics. You need to start with what you know. You need to verify the model rate, and those are the main facilities. Remember, just make sure that both, both rates are actually the same. Believe it or not, all too often people tend to forget to put items such as a third-party gas or a third-party well, so you actually need to make sure you're entering the data too. You need to start with the main facilities and then start to work your way out. You need to look for your data signatures. Look, for example, if there is a step change or a systemic difference. Those type of information are actually to further allow us to figure out what we're missing in your model and whether or not there could be a disjoint. And then lastly, prior to making any kind of adjustments to your model, you need to make sure you validate it or that you confirm that the additional loss actually exist and then understand or realize that you actually know how to treat it. The surface calibration is only the first step and perhaps is the longest portion of this presentation. Because unfortunately, many people tend to have the common mistake of trying to overmatch the system when they don't really understand the data. So this is what I kind of like focus most, mostly on this today. Once we have done our surface calibration, then our next step will be uh, to change the model into forecast mode and then to make sure you're accounting for all those changing conditions. We need to include three components. We want to include the availability or our inflow model, and this in actual conjunction with our reserves, because with this we can account for the change in reservoir pressure as it changes with the depletion. You also want to model the compressor capacity, and then modeling all these things will actually allow us to keep our model within a reasonable range, and also within reasonable limits of what the field is actually capable of producing. So with the compressors, we need to understand the capability of the unit, and we need to make sure that the compressor capacity curves that you enter are actually representative of the ranges that that compressor that you have can be able to operate. So one of the first steps is actually plotting our current operating point on our compressor capacity curve. <clears throat> the plot that I'm showing in here, it's an aerial compressor performance curve, and it was actually generated with the aerial performance software. So if we look at the top, the top portion of the graph is the brake horsepower versus the suction pressure. And the bottom portion is actually showing our corresponding flow rate versus our suction pressure. The red dot that we have here is indicating my current operating point. So if I plot it on the curve and it doesn't match, I need to investigate to again find out the reasons why this is not, this is not actually on the curve that we have there. So in this slide, the chart that I'm showing here is an extract from the IHS Piper course. And what it's showing is a checklist that we actually suggest going through in order to validate your compressor curve. There are many, many reasons why the operative point might not be landing on the curve. Uh, as a couple of examples, 
We need to understand that systems sometimes are dynamic and they keep changing over the course of the life of the field. The compressors can actually be moved to a different location or the cylinder can actually be replaced. So if we receive this compressor capacity curve, we actually need to make sure that it's actually representative of the compressors that we actually have in, out there in the field. Um, there are a couple of other parameters that can change. You can have changing operative conditions or changing rotating speed. Or maybe the gas analysis that you have is different compared to the analysis that you have when the curves were originally generated. So you need to confirm all those kinds of items as well as operational items as well. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, it's very common to have different, vari different variable volume pocket settings or different clearance settings on a reciprocating type machine, or even like a change in a sliding valve position on a screw unit, for example. So going through this checklist exercise, will actually going to allow us to effectively match our suction pressures and our flowing capabilities to our field. And it is also going to allow us to verify how much capacity we have in that unit. So when we actually move to development and add more wells to the system, we actually can understand how much capacity we have remaining on the compressor that we have in our field. So once we have added our compressor capacity curves to our model, we also need to make sure that we're taking in consideration the reservoir pressure changes as our reservoir depletes. But we also need to consider the reservoir inflow response when we change the surface and bottom hole pressures. So we need to make sure that we select the right reservoir model. For example, if we're going to have any type of conventional reservoirs, we know that the rolling shellard that back pressure equation is pretty good for these type of systems. But if uh, in any case we have a non-conventional system, or very low permeability, we need to make sure that we're actually accounting for this transition between eutransion and boundary dominated flow. Another thing before I actually forget, if we're actually using uh, cold and methane reservoirs, we need to make sure that we account for other factors such as absorbed gas contribution, for example, that we need to consider this kind of information. The plot that I'm showing in this slide um, is showing the gas rate versus time. And the difference between these two models can be quite significant. The red line is using the conventional type model, and the orange line is a transient model. So if the models are actually starting at the same rate, and they're utilizing the same total reservoir volume, you can see that the depletion is very different using an IPR curve versus a horizontal multifrag model. So just bear that in mind and pay a special consideration to this. One, once we have those type of items and before doing the forecast and validation, you also want to include the wellbore component and making sure that you're accounting for frictional and hydrostatic effects throughout the wellbore. The plot that I'm going to show you here is showing the pressure versus your gas rate. The black line indicates the inflow capability at bottom hole conditions, while the pink or pinkish line is actually indicating the wellhead operating conditions. So if we actually draw a vertical line from that black line down to the pink line, it's going to indicate the total frictional and hydrostatic pressure losses that we're going to have within our wellbore. And the benefit of actually using this curve is that it's going to show us it not just in one point, but over multiple operating conditions as, as opposed to just when we have the tubing performance curves. It's also going to show us whether or not we're going to be frictionally restricted as well. If I actually brought your attention to the bottom of the graph when we have the zero pressure line and then we move to the right, we have a theoretical maximum operating condition at wellhead of about 1.15 million scuff, while in the bottom hole is 1.36 million scuff. So this is actually going to indicate that we're going to have a small condition or a small restriction throughout the wellbore. Um, one other benefit of using this plot is that we can identify at what rates liquid loading may be an issue for us. We can actually identify or point out where the blue line is crossing with the black line, and this is the critical liquid rate at the end of the tubing. So if you see, it's a good indi in indicative or a good visual way. And then just to recall on this, the effective motive of actually doing uh, or modeling your system is that we need to consider that we're going to have frictional and hydrostatic losses through that wellbore. So as it could be bottleneck in the system, and you can have effect on any kind of future operating conditions. Once uh, you have incorporated the models and your production forecast has actually been generated, 
the results that you're actually getting can be verified by comparing your historical rates and your pressures to be forecasted. Um, the plot that I have here is showing a common trend between historical and forecasted conditions, and it's actually confirming that the IHS Piper model is actually representative of our actual operating conditions. The ability to view the flowing rates and pressures is going to provide us a quick diagnostic of why the trends are not matching. So, once we have these components into our model, we can do a base case validation, and this is a very important part of wrapping everything up or just tidying everything together. On the primary y-axis we have uh, on the plot is showing the gas rate versus time and the liquid rate versus time. And on our secondary y-axis we're showing the pressure versus time. We have a closer look. Uh, we have the gas rate represented in red. The total liquid rate is represented in purple, and the bottom hole flowing pressure is actually represented in black. So under baseline, baseline scenarios where we're not adding any kind of additional work to the system, or where we're not changing anything to our current operating conditions, we want to see the forecast extrapolate out and actually follow the same historical decline trend. Because where we're having this extrapolation is actually going to allow us to confirm how reasonable our reservoir model is. If let's say for some reason our forecasted trend either dies off quicker, then our history will suggest that we want to look back at our original reservoir model and then determine why our model is underpredicting the total reservoir volume. The other components on this plot, such as our bottom hole flowing pressure and the liquid rate, are actually going to allow us to make sure that we're forecasting in alignment with historical trends. It's also allowing us to further hone in on any other operational components within the model and then confirm that they're actually behaving as anticipated. For example, if we're going to start forecasting this model and I see that there is an increase in the gas rate, when we could review the historical bottom hole flowing pressure and wellhead pressure, then if forecasting at surface at the same historical pressure, but the pressure is way lower at bottom hole conditions, then we're actually going to know that we're not going to be able to adequate more than what is occurring on our wellbore. So as you can see, going through this validation is really, really going to help us to feel more confident with what we're going to get and what our forecast results are actually going to be, and it's going to give us the farther step to actually get into our predictive mode. The next few slides um, are actually diagnostic maps from the IHS Piper software. In this case, I'm showing the frictional pressure loss map. If we actually look at the legend, we can see that anything below 5 psi per mile is shown in purple, and we can go up in 5 psi increments to a pressure of 35 psi per mile, or higher, which there is actually shown in the red color. So in this model, the cooler colors actually represent that there is low restriction and um, is also low pipe and capacity, while the warmer colors or the red colors you actually indicate that we're having any potential restriction or any potential bottlenecks. This is a really, really good visual way of identifying where we have any kind of potential restrictions. But the real power that we're actually going to have is if we're going to put this together with our reservoir model. Because if you just look at this model, we may think that, for example, within the red portion, there are going to be loads of restrictions. However, if we actually tie this with the, the reservoir capability, the story might be a slightly different. The next uh, slide is um, the well uplift map, and it's actually showing us the difference between our absolute open flow conditions at a specific point in time and our current operating conditions or current operating rate. So right away, we can actually we can identify or we can pinpoint where we're having remaining potential. The light color of the wells is going to indicate that there is less than 0 0.25 million scab remaining between your absolute open flow and your current operating conditions. And then as this color range actually gets warmer, the range increases by 0 0.25 million scab. Sorry. To so very quickly, you can actually identify on one of the lines in the northeast that we have at least three wells with potential. Two of them which actually have a potential on the range between 0 0.25 and 0 0.5 million scuff, and in one, the one in red, where we actually have a potential that is greater than 1.75 million. So this map is actually going to allow us to focus on the regions that we have most potential, and then we can actually have a look at the possibility of implementing any kind of optimization scenarios, such as our, whether or not it's better to look at line looping, or if we're going to be better to add compression or if it's better to add both pipeline and compression capacity. 
So the next plot that I'm going to show you is a plot that combines all of the reservoir inflow models at one specific point in time. And the curve is the summation of the inflow at certain node or at certain conjunction in, in the system. So as you observe here, we're plotting the pressure versus rate. And the root curve is indicating the current inflow capability when operating on a specific given pressure at that point in the system. So if we're actually going to take into account all the frictional and hydrostatic uh, losses upstream of this location, this is going to represent by the red curve. But then, if you pay attention to the green curve, this one is going to show us if we're going to remove all the frictional and potential hydrostatic losses that we're going to have within that line, the potential rate that we actually could produce. So, by a simple visual way, this curve is actually going to allow us to make a quick evaluation and potentially determine if whether or not adding additional pipeline or adding additional compressional capacity, if we're actually going to improve our production. Um, so just to summarize, there are really five main components that are going to help us produce a reliable pipeline model. We need to start with our surface calibration and then make sure that any additional losses within the system are going to be reflected on the changing conditions. Then we need to make sure that we're, we're going to move to forecast mode. We're only going to model within the applicable ranges that we have on that field. We also need to make sure that our, as I mentioned before, our compressor capacity curve is going to be representative of the units that we actually have out on the field. And another thing, you need to make sure that your deliverability model or your inflow model is going to perform the same way and of course is going to take all account the velocities within the wellbore. The only way to really wrap this up is actually making sure that you go through all these forecast validation techniques and at the end you make sure that your historical production is actually matching your extrapolated forecast results. This is just a very quick summary of the steps that you actually need to follow to ensure that you actually have reliable pipeline modeling. Um, well, this has been the presentation. Um, before we go, I actually want to acknowledge the work that uh, Tara Bobosel, who's the Piper Senior Product Manager, as uh, she's the original owner and creator of this presentation. And I also want to acknowledge the work that has been done by Ralph McNeil and Dave Lilico, as they have been applying these models for quite some time, and they have been able to document this work as well. And lastly, I will thank Kevin Dan, who actually presented this material and also helped with this presentation. Thank you, Sylvia, for your excellent and informative presentation. Um, a couple of questions came in in the course of your presentation, and I will read them to you. Uh, the first one, which multi-phase flow, co uh, multi flow correlation will you suggest using? Uh, thank you, Henry. That's a really good question. And I have to say that it completely depends on the type of correlation that you're thinking about. Just as a normal example, within the IHS Piper software that we have, we have different correlations. We have, for example, a mechanistic model that is called uh, Petalas and Assis, but we also have other correlations such as the Flanagan or the modified Bex and Bruce correlation. So you, can, you have to actually make sure that uh, you're using those specific correlations based on the type of uh, reservoir or the type of developed region that you have. For example, as in, in general terms, like if uh, Bex and Bruce was actually developed on a test situation, I think it was flowing air and water through the unit. So in the case that you have a water, uh, gas water type situation, then you can actually use the correlation on that range. Plus, if I put another example, uh, petalas and assist is a very, very detailed correlation and it actually covers all parameters such as pipeline inclination, flow regime. So it's a good correlation uh, that you can actually use because it kind of covers a much larger range of situations. Thank you, Sylvia. The, the second one is how to forecast once liquid loading occurs. Um, once liquid loading occurs, uh, I'd probably say there are certain assumptions that you can make. As you may well know, in some cases, you can uh, it may load up very quickly, or uh, we might not be really sure at what rate it will load up. So when we're actually doing any kind of forecasting, we have a couple of different options that we can actually understand or take in consideration. You can either identify that it's liquid loaded and then choose to shut that model, or you can send it to apply some different methods. Uh, for example, in the, case that, in the case that maybe you were to add a plunger lift, 
we look at trends, you tend to look at areas, you need to look at if there is a reduction on your decline or your production actually declines by 10%. So within the model, you can actually reduce your production by 10% as well. Or in the case where you're actually going to add a submersible pump, you can actually initiate that within the model. The, the third one is how to differentiate between hydrostatic and frictional pressure loss. Um, I'd probably say this is a good thing. Like when you actually look at the questions, you can actually see that the frictional loss component is mainly dominated by the velocity square. When, as for example, if you look at the hydrostatic, that one is actually dominated mostly by the height change and the density of the fluid. So when you can see that there is an additional pressure loss that we're not considering to hone in, you actually mm, can see that if actually quite low, then it might not be related to a frictional in that case. I don't know if I'm clear on that, but I can follow up with the person that actually asked that question and verify more details on it. That is good. Uh, the, the final one that we can take now is, do you have any material related to gathering system analysis? Um, actually, yeah, well, it's not really material, but um, I, if I'm not wrong, on the 16th of April, we're going to be running a presentation on actually how to quickly identify existing bottlenecks, as well as um, maybe providing an interface to run optimization and decommissioning in scenarios. And if I'm not wrong, uh, let me see, I have a, uh, my next slide is actually going to show a couple of links that are going to point out like information either related to our software or related to to the future webinars that we have. Oh, that's good, and uh, you can actually follow up with the person thereafter. Uh, I I think we have run out of time now. Thanks a lot for your time during this presentation. I hope it was an interesting one and we have been of great interest to you. Uh, Sylvia will follow up with any further questions that arise during this presentation. Have a nice day and thank you. Thanks everyone for your time.